is holy and just by his power we trust in his love great is the lord he is faithful and true by his mercy he proves he is love great is the lord and worthy of glory great is the lord and worthy of praise great is the lord now lift up your voice now lift up your voice trust in his love great is the lord he is faithful and true by his mercy he proves he is love great is the lord and worthy of glory great is the lord and worthy of praise great is the lord now lift up your voice now lift up your voice morning. Welcome to First Christian Church of Cuyahoga Falls. I am Pastor Joy Fenton Jones, and whether you are sitting here in the sanctuary this morning or you're worshiping with us on the live stream, it's good to be together in worship. We are going to begin today, as has become our habit, by just giving ourselves the gift of a minute. So I want to invite you uh, to just settle in right where you are, whether that's here in a pew or at home on your couch or in a chair and uh, take a couple of deep breaths, and we are just going to center our minds and our hearts for worship as we listen to Beth play our prelude this morning. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom, join me for the call to worship. Do you want to see me broken, bowed headed and lowered eyes? Shoulders falling down with light teardrops, weakened by my soulful pride. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Because I laugh like I've got your mind, digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Please join us for our gathering song, God of Grace and God of Glory, in number 464, verses 1, 2, and 5.
to a time of sharing our joys and our concerns so that we can support each other in prayer. Uh, Kylie's got our microphone today and so she will bring that around to you if you have something you would like to lift so that we can pray for each other today. Does it need, is it on? Not working? Okay. Well, Steve, why don't you speak as loudly as you can and I'll reflect it back today. We'll do it. Oh, oh, we got it. Okay. It works. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to have prayers for my friend Megan, who's having severe problems with vision in one eye. Mm -hmm. And I would also like prayers for Donna Stockman and her daughter Cheryl. Uh, Cheryl underwent a heart catheterization this week. She had two arteries that were blocked. One they were able to take care of. The other artery has two blocks, which makes it extremely uh, hard to get uh, unblocked. So in two weeks, she's going back, and hopefully they can uh, unblock that artery. So please keep Donna as well as uh, Cheryl, in your prayers. Thanks, Steve. Um, I would like to ask for prayers for Sharon Manier. Um, a couple weeks ago, she was at the store and she picked up like a big pot with a flower in it to take it home, and she hurt her back. Mm -hmm. And she's been having a lot of problems with her back, and she's still in a lot of pain. So, prayers for Sharon. Thank you. I'd like to ask for prayers for a very dear uh, friend of mine, Diane MacArthur. She received hernia surgery successfully, but during that they discovered ovarian cancer. Mm. So she'll be going through chemo and will need your prayers, I'm sure. And prayers for Sandy and Ron who are on a well-deserved vacation that they will return home safe and sound. Thanks, Diana. I'd like to ask for prayers for a family friend. Uh, just got out of ICU. Her name's Tammy Stennett. She's going through heart failure. She only has 18% of her heart left. And then I would like, uh, I got a joy. My two nieces are here for the first time, Emma and Mackenzie. So that's my joy. Welcome. Um, prayers for my teacher's family. They are an hour away from the Ukraine border. Your teacher's family. The Almacy family. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Will you join me in a spirit and attitude of prayer this morning? Gracious God, we come before you today, and we are grateful for your presence with us, for the way that you sustain us, for the way that you walk with us through the mountains and the valleys of our lives. This morning, we recognize that there are a lot of reasons we have to count our blessings. We are privileged to live in a safe country. We're privileged to live in homes and places of shelter. We're privileged to be able to gather in this place this morning and worship in the way that we choose. And we don't take those blessings for granted today. We are also particularly grateful this morning for the gift of family. Uh, we celebrate with Randy that his two nieces were able to be here with him this morning. We welcome them uh, into this community, and we just thank you for their presence here today. We also celebrate with Sandy and Ron as they are able to get uh, some well-deserved time away, and we ask that this vacation would be a time of rest and a time of renewal and a time of blessing for the two of them. We pray that you would keep them safe uh, and bring them back to us uh, at the appointed time. God, even as we have so many reasons uh, to express our gratitude this morning, we also recognize there are people we love and care about who are facing some really difficult challenges right now. And we want to take the time to lift them up before you today and ask that you would just be a particular source of grace and blessing to them in the way that they most need right now. We want to lift Megan up to you, dealing with these serious vision problems in one eye. Uh, we rec recognize what a limiting thing that can be. And so we ask uh, that you would grant wisdom to the people who are caring for her, um, that those problems might be able to be resolved, and that in the meantime, you would give her the strength and the grace uh, to adapt so that she can move forward with her life in the best way possible. We want to lift Donna up to you this morning and her daughter Cheryl, as Cheryl has suffered this heart attack um, and now faces a difficult road removing this blockage from that second artery. We ask that you would just be with her, that you would grant wisdom to the folks who are going to be performing these procedures in a couple of weeks, that they would be able to find a way forward, and that Cheryl would quickly be back on a path to health and wholeness. We just ask that you would grant both Cheryl and Donna a lot of grace uh, in these next couple of weeks. We want to lift Sharon up to you this morning, dealing with these back problems. Um, it is hard and it's draining to be in pain. So we just ask that you would surround Sharon with your grace uh, and that there would be a way found to alleviate her pain uh, so that she might be able to more fully function in the way that she needs to do. We want to lift Janet's friend Diane up to you. We're grateful that she came through this hernia surgery, but now we hear that she has received a really tough diagnosis. We know that means a long road ahead. So we ask that you would just strengthen not only her body, but her mind and her spirit so that she might have the fortitude uh, to walk this path that is ahead of her. We ask again that you would just grant wisdom and grace to all of the people who are going to take very good care of her as she undergoes chemo. Um, we ask that they would be a source of encouragement, that you would bring people alongside Diane who are able to walk with her through this difficult time. We want to pray for Tammy this morning. Um, dealing with heart failure, we ask that you would just surround her with your strength, with your grace, that you would place your healing hand upon her. Uh, we ask that the people caring for her would just be filled with love and grace for her, um, and that they would be able to provide her the best care possible as she also walks a difficult road. And then God, we do not forget um, that brothers and sisters of ours members of your wider family are still suffering, are still fighting for their freedom in Ukraine. We would particularly lift up this morning um, Kylie's teacher's family who find themselves very close to that conflict. We ask that you would keep them safe. We ask that you would surround um, all of those people with your grace, uh, with protection, and that you would just continue to raise up courageous leaders who would be able to find a way forward that moves toward peace. God, we place all these things in your hands this morning because we know how much you love and care for us, and we also recognize there are things we hold in our hearts that we do not always choose to speak aloud. So this morning, we would just keep silence for you, before you for just a moment and simply ask that you meet each one of us right where we are. It is in a spirit of shared community and a spirit of hope that we pray together as Jesus taught his disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll close our prayer time by singing together uh, number 632 in your blue hymnal, Lead On, O King Eternal, just verses 1 and 3. is from John 14 23 through 29 Jesus answered him those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them whoever does not love me does not keep my words and the word that you hear is not mine but is from the father who sent me I have said these things to you while I am still with you but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You hear me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so when it does occur, you may believe. Well, I'll invite any children and young people who'd like to come forward for just a moment, for our children's moment. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Well, I got a question for you this morning, as usual. Seems I always have a question on my mind. And as always, audience participation is welcome. I wanted to ask you today, what do you do when you have got either like a big assignment or a tough challenge or a problem or something you need to get through? I'm looking for some strategies here. What do you do when you've got a big challenge? Yes. Okay, so sometimes a little bit of distraction. If it's like too much stress and you're just starting to worry, then the, she said some fidgets, play with some fidgets, and take some deep breaths. Those are two excellent, two excellent ideas. What else? I drink, a lot of drink a lot of coffee, okay? That might be the opposite strategy of the fidgets and the deep breaths, right? One brings you down, the other one revs you back up. <laughs> you're ready to get that get tackling. I, I'm with you, Jamie, on the coffee. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that. So if it's like a math problem, you think, okay, what have I learned maybe from my teacher about the dots or ways I can like break it down and do it one step at a time? That is brilliant, and I, I love that idea. So sometimes when we have a big problem, we need to think, what tools do I have in my mind, and how do I break it down and take it one step at a time? That's really good. You use, you play with your poppet. So maybe that helps you calm down, or maybe it helps you think a little bit about how you're going to approach that problem. Is it pink, did you say? 
Oh, it helps you think. Yes, sorry. Yes, it helps you think. I love that. That's very good. Color, okay. You know, there is a whole movement of sacred coloring where you color in pictures to kind of help you focus and think about um, the presence of God's spirit. So thank you for mentioning that. These are all great ideas. Anybody else want to throw one in there? Got a big problem, big challenge? Chocolate for you, okay. When you need a little boost, a little mood enhancement to tackle that problem, you get a little chocolate. Anybody ever ask for help? You got a big, big challenge, something coming? Maybe you just say, I need, I need a hand with this. Even if it's something simple like moving a really big thing out of your room or into your room, right? Yeah, it's okay. You got another one? draw and play with your puppet and it helps you think. I love that. That's really good stuff. Well, this morning we are going to hear a story actually in the sermon about a very determined woman. She had a lot of challenges to overcome and she really faced them down in a in an impressive way. And we're going to hear a Bible story about Paul who also did some very big determined things. And sometimes I think when we hear these stories about either famous people or Bible characters and the amazing things they did, we think to ourselves whoa, that person is like so incredible and they just did this huge thing and it all happened overnight and I'm never going to be like that. And I think we need a reminder sometimes that when we read these big stories, whether they're about famous people or about Bible characters, that those people had to do the very same things we do. They had to ask for help. They had to break it down and use what they knew and take it one step at a time. I bet they stopped and took deep breaths and prayed and did things to help them calm down and focus. They did normal, everyday people things to help them tackle those big, big challenges. So I think it's a good reminder to us, next time you face a big problem, use those strategies and you can be determined to tackle it, whatever it is. Let's pray. Will you repeat after me? Dear God, you help us do big things and you also help us do little things. Like take deep breaths, take one step at a time, and ask for help. So help us be determined, and help us rely on you. Amen. You can come up for a snack if you all want. Our second reading this morning comes from Acts. We've been uh, working our way through passages in Acts here this month, and we're going to continue that this morning in Acts chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. It starts this way. One night Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When Paul had seen the vision, We, he and his friends, immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went out Uh, outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who had gathered there, a certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home and she prevailed upon us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I was an avid reader as a young person. I loved nothing more than to curl up somewhere and plow through one book after another. I read every Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew mystery I could find. Anybody remember those? I'm dating myself, yes. (laughs) I was a big Sherlock Holmes fan, and I would polish off assigned books for school often in a single afternoon. As much as I loved finding new things to read, there were a handful of books growing up that so captured my imagination that I read them again and again and again 
and again. Whether you were a big reader growing up or not, I bet you have a book or two like this that you've just gone back to over the years. You've read it more than once. It's a favorite. One of my favorites was a sort of quasi-accurate historical fiction about a young woman who was among the early settlers of Plymouth. It documented with reasonable accuracy many of the struggles faced by those first rather ill-prepared immigrants to this continent. Another of my favorites was a curious little volume describing some of the great medical minds throughout history, from the ancient Greek physician Galen, who first learned how blood circulated through the body, to Edward Jenner, who courageously developed an effective smallpox vaccine against considerable opposition. Lest you think my taste in books ran only to the serious, another of my favorites was a wacky work of fiction in which a group of kids went up against this evil group of adults who were trying to turn all the kids into evil automatons using this terrible black crown. I'm pretty sure this was an early but rather unsuccessful effort at writing something like the Harry Potter series. I was always on the hunt for new reading material and I left no genre untouched, but no book captured my admiration more than the simple biography I had of Clara Barton a Civil War nurse who demonstrated unbelievable courage and strength on the front lines of that horrific war and was ultimately responsible for the founding of the American Red Cross. Clara Barton was born on Christmas Day in 1821. She was quiet and painfully shy, but a generous person from the very beginning. Her family told this story about one of her early birthdays. She was turning maybe six or seven, and she had the privilege of cutting her own cake. She portioned out big pieces for her parents and for her numerous brothers and sisters, only to realize that she hadn't left any cake for herself. It's one of those family legends that sort of seemed to typify the type of person she was throughout her whole life. After teaching school for a few years, a career she found miserable because of her shyness, Clara moved to Washington, D.C., and she actually became one of the first women to work for the federal government. She held a quiet job in the U.S. Patent Office, a post she occupied when the Civil War broke out in full force. I want to share with you just a small portion of Clara's biography as it is provided on the website of the American Red Cross. Clara Burton was working as a recording clerk in the U.S. Patent Office in Washington, D.C. when the first units of federal troops poured into that city in 1861. The war had just begun, these troops were newly recruited, and residents in the capital were alarmed and confused. Barton perceived an immediate need in all this chaos for providing personal assistance to the men in uniform, some of whom were already wounded, many hungry, and some without bedding or any clothing except what they had on their backs. She took supplies to the young men of the 6th Massachusetts Infantry who had been attacked in Baltimore, Maryland. She quickly discovered that many of these were her boys, as she put it. She'd grown up with them. Some of them she had even taught in school. She provided clothing and assorted foods and supplies to the sick and wounded. She collected relief articles and appealed to the public for others. Besides supplies, though, she offered personal support for the men in the hopes of keeping their spirits up. She read to them, wrote letters home for them, listened to their personal problems, and prayed with them. She knew, however, that where she was needed most was not behind the lines in Washington, but on the battlefields where the suffering was greatest. That ends the quote. This realization that help was desperately needed on the front lines led shy, quiet Clara Barton, who was already past 40 years old at this point, to undertake a tireless crusade that repeatedly took her to the front lines of the most dangerous and hard-fought battles of the American Civil War. She risked her life almost constantly. She arranged for and personally delivered countless supplies to the most heated centers of conflict, and she undoubtedly saved innumerable lives. There are multiple accounts of times she was nearly killed, including one in which a bullet pierced her skirts 
missing her body by inches. Known as the angel of the battlefield, Barton defied stereotypes about her age and her gender. She completely transcended her own shyness, and she always offered care and support to any soldier in need, whether they were Union or Confederate. She was a remarkable, remarkable woman. Claire's path to accomplishing all she did was never easy. There were many, most actually, who felt strongly that women did not belong on the battlefield. She had to lobby the federal government for passes to get to the front lines at all. This shy, quiet woman who found school teaching miserable because it re required her to interact with students, lobbied a bunch of intimidating older men for the necessary clearance to get herself and her supplies transported to the fields of battle. When it came to saving people's lives and providing care, she was absolutely unstoppable. I mentioned at the outset that Clara Barton was ultimately responsible for founding the American Red Cross. Today, the Red Cross is such a widely known and accepted organization that it's hard to imagine a time it didn't exist. That said, the Red Cross in this country almost didn't exist. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the history of the Red Cross globally, but the organization did not begin here. In fact, the Red Cross movement began in Switzerland, where it was adopted by several European countries in 1863. This was tied very closely to the ratification of the Geneva Convention in 1864, an agreement the US did affirm, but it would be another 20 years before the United States founded our own arm of the Red Cross. It was Clara Barton who, on a trip to Switzerland, realized that this Red Cross organization was exactly what was needed in the United States to provide competent care to all those wounded in conflict, regardless of which side of the battle they were on. After seeing the organization and effectiveness of the Red Cross in Europe, she returned to the United States armed with a proposal for a Red Cross here. And one would think that in the wake of such a devastating conflict as the Civil War, our country would have been quick to adopt her suggestion. But as with every other aspect of her work, this achievement did not come easily either. Barton met with considerable resistance from political leaders who, for one thing, wanted to believe, and we will all feel the pangs of sad irony here, they wanted to believe that the United States would never again be at war, having learned such devastating lessons from our own civil conflict. High-minded and optimistic thinking, but it couldn't have been further from the truth. Nonetheless, those high-minded politicians fought Clara Barton, saying, we have no need for a Red Cross here. Others felt it was an unnecessary foreign entanglement, a sentiment that is also all too common these days. The Red Cross was, it was a European thing. It wasn't our idea. It wasn't America first, if you'll pardon the expression. Based on the need to be in charge, in charge and call the shots, politicians fought Clara Barton, asserting we had no need for a Red Cross here. In the end, it seems Barton won her argument largely through creativity, prevailing upon leaders that the Red Cross could serve in the wake of natural disasters, even if the US never again went to war. Even with that accommodation, it took her five years and two changes in presidential administrations to finally convince the United States to found the American Red Cross. Let no one say this woman was not determined. I've now devoted about two thirds of our sermon time this morning to telling you about Clara Barton and the founding of the American Red Cross. Now this is partly because our reading today from Acts is relatively brief. It's a simple piece of narrative and it doesn't have a lot of action. It's basically a mini travelogue in which Paul describes the vision and subsequent trip that took him to the region of Macedonia. One night, Paul has this dream, and in it he sees a Macedonian man pleading with him to visit that region and help the people there. We can summarize the rest of the passage in a few words. Paul gets the message, Paul packs up, and Paul goes. He is convinced that these people need and deserve to hear the good news of the gospel, and so Paul also becomes unstoppable. As if 
it's no big deal. He describes setting sail from one city to another, to Neapolis, then Philippi, and reaching the region of Macedonia. And once there, Paul meets up with this God-fearing woman named Lydia, who is eager to hear the stories of Jesus and ultimately provides Paul and his companions hospitality for the remainder of their stay in that area. And that's it. That's the whole story this morning. It's a story in which Paul hears the call and is willing to go no matter the distance and the difficulty. It's one of many journeys Paul undertook in order to share the good news of Jesus with everyone he possibly could. Let no one say Paul was not determined either. You know, pastors often like to give three or four points to consider uh, from a particular passage, and I use that formula myself tonight. Today, however, I have just one point for you. When it comes to our determination as Christians, I think sometimes we have tricked something out of the biblical text that really shepherds us in the wrong direction. When we read about a person like Clara Barton, and obviously there are many other inspiring figures like her throughout history, we need to acknowledge that what made her ministry and her work so powerful is that she actually did something. Her determination was not directed toward belief or ideology. It was directed toward actually transforming people's lives. She did not sit in Washington, D.C., going on and on about how everyone needed to think differently about medical care on the battlefield or believe in the value of neutral aid for all those involved in conflict. She advocated for people by actually getting out there and doing something about it. The, we, the reason we remember her and talk about her is because she actually did something. I don't want to unfairly pick on Christians this morning. The truth is that all people in our humanity have a little bit of a tendency to get up on our soapboxes about any number of ideas and ideologies, all without much willingness to actually do anything about any of it. That is a shared human quality. However, I think there are some pitfalls in our reading of scripture that have partially pointed us down the wrong path in this respect. So I want to say something very clearly about Paul and the ministry he and his colleagues carried out in the first century. We have misinterpreted the text in such a way that we often think Paul's primary intent was to travel all over the place converting people so they would believe in Jesus and think differently about their faith. I assert to you this morning that is a bad interpretation of scripture and of the book of Acts. For Paul, as with his friends and colleagues, following Jesus was not just a matter of thinking and believing. It was a way of living that called upon people to act differently, to do something. It doesn't take a lot of determination to sit and think. It takes enormous determination to convince early believers that those without money should sell their expensive stuff to help take care of the people who didn't have any. That's what they did. It took enormous determination to convince communities of early believers that it was their responsibility to support widows, orphans, people with disabilities, and others who couldn't support themselves in that culture. That's what they did. It took enormous determination to convince communities of early believers that they needed to stand up to the powers around them and actually fight for justice on behalf of those who couldn't fight for themselves. That's what they did. So here is the one point this morning. Being faithful followers of Jesus Christ means we must be determined to do something. Believing things and thinking things is all well and good, but I don't think that's the kind of determination God asks for from us. We are called to emulate a Savior who literally fed people, healed people, advocated for the ongoing care of those who were on the margins, and outright condemned religious leaders who sat in their ivory towers just thinking about stuff. When we read about Paul and Peter and Silas and Barnabas and the way they brought salvation into people's homes, it doesn't mean those people just knelt down, 
prayed a 15 second prayer and believed something different than they did before. Salvation came into people's homes because they determined to live their lives differently, to act differently and with greater determination than they had before. So I ask you today, First Christian Church, what are we, followers of Jesus Christ, determined to do? What battlefield are we brave enough to enter? What cause are we passionate enough to champion? Whose lives are we determined to transform? I hope, at a minimum, our own. Amen. We move now to a time of responding to God's word. One of the ways we do that is with our tithes and our offerings. I think Jamie is going to walk our plate down and back today, but I always want to remind you that money is just one of a lot of ways that we respond to the Holy Spirit in our own lives. So I would just encourage you as we sing our offertory song this morning to be attentive to the nudge of the Holy Spirit in your own heart in whatever form that might take. We're going to sing together verses 1 and 2 of Called as Partners in Christ's Service. prayer of dedication on the screen. God of perseverance, this morning we confess we do not always have the energy to persevere. We do not always feel inspired to keep on keeping on. We do not always feel motivated to plow through obstacles. And so today we pray in the words of the prophets, even youth will faint and be weary and the young will fall exhausted, but those of us who walk with God shall renew our strength. We shall mount up with wings like eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. We bring our gifts this morning with this prayer that you grant us the determination we need to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for communion, I will remind you that uh, we practice an open table. You do not need to be a member of this or any particular church to take communion this morning. All are welcome at God's table, and uh, we will be taking communion this morning by coming forward. Uh, I'll be holding the bread in the center. You'll take a piece, and then you can go to either station to receive the cup and then return to your seats by the side aisle. Let's sing together our song of preparation for communion, Lord, be glorified in the praise binder. Yo no. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. All are welcome at this table, for certainly these two are gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for the many blessings we receive from you. We thank you for the Christ you sent into our lives, who first sent, set this table for us to receive communion, to receive the bread and cup, as well as seek and find forgiveness. Bless this bread and bless this cup. Bless us. May we live our lives worthy of your love and grace. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Say, take this bread, take this wine, now the simple made divine, for any to receive. By your mercy we come to your table, by your grace you are making us faithful, Lord, we remember. And as we worship you, 
We got lots of fun announcements this morning. First and foremost, we have got a bunch of meetings this week. And our meetings here at First Christian Church are fun because you're fun people. And when we get together, even when it's to talk about business, we have a good time. So we have got worship and vision and vitality happening tomorrow evening. Uh, worship's at 6, vision and vitality at 7. We have an elders meeting next Sunday, May 29th after church. Uh, I want to remind you that Elizabeth Lindy's graduation party is coming up next Sunday after church, so you can check back in your email for details about that. I also want to remind you that we are going to celebrate, um, I'll come to this announcement in a minute, we're going to celebrate all of our graduates here on June 5th. We've got a lot of folks whose lives touch our congregation who are passing some milestones. We are going to celebrate them. That's on Sunday, June 5th, and we will have a reception following church for those folks. There is going to be a postcard writing campaign. It's going to take place Wednesday evening, June 1st, at Brexville United Methodist Church. So that's up north of here, um, about 25 minutes. They're actually writing uh, postcards to oppose House Bill 616. You can read more about that. I'm not going to get into a lot of details this morning, but if you would like more information, um, I'd love for you to join us that evening in that important work. I know that we are accepting some donations for the car show. That is starting up really soon. We are just a couple weeks away from uh, the first car show. Cash only this year. I know in the past we've donated items and those kinds of things. There are envelopes right out on the table, so if you're willing to pitch in a few bucks, that would be greatly appreciated as we move toward uh, offering our food again this year at the car show. And I think that that is all the uh, announcements on the screen. So I'll invite you to stand as you're able, whether that's in body or in spirit. And we're going to close by singing the first and fifth verses of Lord, You Give the Great Commission. from this place, uh, not just to think, not just to believe things, but to do the kind of work, the kind of determined work that transforms lives. Go from this place in a spirit of peace and a spirit of hope. Amen. <laughs>